Today's lesson covers the derivation of the equations of motion for a satellite in orbit around a much larger body, as well as the basic geometry of the resulting elliptical orbit. We'll start by considering the Earth, and a satellite in orbit around the Earth looks a lot like a GPS satellite. We'll characterize the state of the satellite by using two vectors, the position r and velocity v. The position vector is measured from the center of the Earth to the satellite's position, and the velocity vector shows its direction of motion. Together, these two vectors can be used to define an orbit, in this case elliptical, of the satellite around the Earth. Now let's look at the forces acting upon our satellite. First and foremost, of course, we have the gravity of the Earth directed opposite the position vector, called F sub G Earth. Next, because we know there is at least some small amount of atmosphere in space, we have the force of drag acting opposite to our velocity vector. There we go. We also know that other large bodies in space exert gravitational pull on our satellites, so we'll include gravity due to the sun, and I suppose we should also include the moon, and while we're at it, why not Jupiter too, it's a big planet. All exert some measurable gravitational force on our satellite that's a function of their size and distance. We can't possibly calculate all of the gravitational forces, so we'll just add, invent a term called F other, then catch all the cats and dogs of gravity, solar wind, and whatever other small forces may be acting upon our satellite at the time. Finally, our satellite may have thrusters on board, so we'll add F sub thrust to our picture as well. There we go. Next, we learned in our introductory mech classes that we need to sum these forces, and that summation must equal, according to Newton's second law, the time rate of change of the satellite's momentum, or dp dt. Let's start off by simplifying this equation and just assume that we're not using any thrusters or doing anything that would cause our mass to change. If that's the case, then Newton's second law becomes dv dt or, or m times the second derivative of the position vector. We also call that r double dot or just mass times acceleration m a. For our purposes, let's stick to the m our double dot expression, okay? So, returning to our very busy program, uh, diagram, let's look a little closer at some of the many forces we showed and see if we can't simplify the equation a little bit by using some assumptions. First, we said that our mass wasn't changing because we weren't thrusting, so my force goes away. Next, we'll assume that the force of drag is very small, which it is compared to the force of gravity from the Earth, so that one's gone. Jupiter is a big planet, but it's millions of kilometers away, so that term can be ignored without much penalty. And the same can be said for the gravity of the moon and the sun. They may affect our tides, but their impact on a satellite's motion is very small. Finally, we'll ignore all those other forces, leaving us with just one force acting on our satellite, the Earth's gravity. In addition to the three laws of motion, Newton also gave us a great equation describing gravity. So let's use that next. I've got the universal gravitation constant, g, the mass of both the Earth and the satellite, and it's divided by the magnitude of the position vector, the satellite's distance from the center of the Earth squared. To describe the direction of the force of gravity, we use a unit vector r hat and put a negative sign in front of that to indicate that gravity acts in the direction opposite our position vector. Next, we'll make a simplifying step by merging G and M Earth into one constant we'll call mu, the Earth's gravitational constant, equal to 398,600.5 kilometers cubed per second squared. So that's the sum of our forces. And oh, let's not forget the uh, minus sign, since the force acts in the opposite direction of position vector. And we'll see that e that equal to m r double dot next. There we go. We can see too that the mass of the satellite appears on both sides of the equation. So let's divide those out. And let's come on, do that. Got it. Okay. Voila. On the next page, we have a much cleaner result. Moving everything to the left-hand side of the equation now gives us what we're after, the simplified two-body equation of motion for a satellite based upon the assumptions that the Earth's gravity is the only force acting on the satellite, the Earth is much bigger than the satellite, and that the Earth's gravity acts as if it emanates from a single point at the center of the Earth.
That clever Newton managed to solve this equation too, and here's the result. It's the equation of a conic section with two constants, A and E, and a single variable nu that we'll discuss in a moment. Your text has a full derivation of the solution on page 716. Now let's look at one of those conic sections, an ellipse, and the geometry of a satellite in an elliptical orbit. We'll start by adding r and v vectors, as before, to define our state, and then recall that every ellipse has two foci. Kepler said that for the case of an orbit around the Earth, the Earth's center is at one focus. We'll call that the other one, f prime, the vacant focus. The closest approach of the satellite to the Earth focus is called perigee. So that distance is r perigee, and the farthest distance is r apogee. If we sum those two together, then we get the major or longest axis of the ellipse, 2a. The semi-major axis, a, that we just saw in the solution of the two-body equation, is half this distance. And the shortest axis, or minor axis, is then 2b, and we can see that on the right. r apogee minus r perigee gives us the distance between the two foci. We'll call that 2c. Next, we'll define nu, the true anomaly, as the angle from perigee to the satellite's current position measured in the direction of satellite motion. And we'll get one more useful angle by drawing a line that shows the local horizon for our satellite, a line perpendicular to our position vector, and defining the satellite's flight path angle phi as the angle from the horizon to our velocity vector. <clears throat> if we look at the satellite in another position in its orbit, this all works the same. R and V vectors, there we go, a true anomaly, and then our flight path angle. When our satellite is increasing in altitude, phi is positive. When it's heading towards perigee, phi is negative. If true anomaly is zero at perigee, or 180 degrees at apogee, then phi is zero. Our R and V vectors are perpendicular to each other at these points. Phi is also zero everywhere in a circular orbit. Think about that for a minute. So, let's talk about eccentricity, the other constant in our solution to the two-body equation of motion. Eccentricity is how non-circular or elliptical our orbit is. Here's the equation for E in terms of the distance at perigee and apogee, or in terms of C and A. We can also turn the tables and use this definition to help us find our apogee and our perigee given a satellite's semi-major axis A and its eccentricity E. So now, let's put all of this into an example where we can use these equations. We'll start with an elliptical orbit with the radii at perigee and apogee as shown here. Your mission is to find the satellite's altitude 90 degrees after it passes perigee, where its true anomaly is 90 degrees. We'll first use RA and RP to solve for the semi-major axis A, which looks like it's going to be about 8,000 kilometers. We'll use those same terms again to solve for eccentricity. There we go. And it looks like it'll be about 1 8 or 0 0.125. Again, our true anomaly is 90 degrees. Now we'll write the solution to the two-body problem and plug in our values for a, e, and nu. <clears throat> it helps a bit that the cosine of 90 degrees is zero, so that term in the denominator goes to zero as a result, and we get an r at this position of 7,875 kilometers. We need to remember that the mean radius of the Earth, though, is 6,378.135 kilometers, so that makes our altitude above the Earth at this point 1,496.865 kilometers. And there you have it. In the next lesson, we'll cover more of this geometry along with the relationships between energy and orbits. Thanks.